All right, guys. So, thanks for coming. I'm going to be doing an intro to 3D. I'm going to be working in cinema. I'm going to keep it very broad so that you guys can apply it to your programs. Um, even though I'm keeping it simple and you already know how to use 3D, I'm sure you're going to learn something because I'm going to try to keep it very, very core in like how, how it actually works in the background. All right, so we've all, we've all plotted y equals mx plus b on this. 3D, you can think about if you took this Cartesian plane and extruded it up so that you had your third dimension, that is your, you know, your 3D environment that you're working in. It's just, you know, you have data values here, data values here, and how those data values are connecting is how you are, you know, working in your, in your uh, I closed it, whoops. So you, you can think of your, um, your process, you can divide into three parts, which is, you know, modeling, texturing, and then your lighting and rendering. In this, in this thing, I'm, in this uh, tutorial, I'm going to focus mostly on modeling. All right, viewport. Let's, let's jump in. So for those of you who have never been, or all of you probably have been, but all 3D um, viewports are pretty much the same. You have um, your main viewport area, which you can divide into three sections. So perspective, top, right, front. Um, usually on the on one side you're gonna have an object manager where all your objects in your scene are gonna come up and you can manage all your hierarchies and everything at the top you're gonna have your shelf tools which are um, pre-made uh, tools to accomplish simple tasks like you know making a primitive you're never gonna wanna you know model a cube from a from from like starting with one point no one does that usually wanna start off with a primitive let's go. So, what I was just saying, parametric objects or primitive objects are uh, preset objects that are created using mathematical formulas which contain, you know, edi editable parameters. And uh, the, the key difference is that it's not a 3D mesh. You don't actually necessarily have individual point data. The program is just saying, at this spot we need, you know, a cube. So, here's the mathematical definition for a cube, and, you know, here's the cube. The, the advantage of, of you know, you, keeping your objects parametric is that, let's say you want a scene where you have 100,000 spheres. Instead of having 100,000 sphere meshes with 100 polygons each, you have 100,000 know, points that are holding the data for a sphere. So when, like, for your program, that's a massive difference. It's the difference between 100,000 keys of data and you know, 100 million points. You know? So it's important to keep those things in mind. Um, but as soon as you make a parametric object editable, it turns it into a mesh, meaning every individual point now has a point in space, and you have all that data to work with. So, just a, just a quick note, when you make something editable, that's something unique to Cinema 4D. It like, could get maximum and make it editable. You just click it and it makes it with all those points. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, points, edges, and polys. I'm sure you guys all know this. Points, two points make an edge. Three or more edges make a polygon. Um, but the it's important to know the differences between the kinds of polygons. So three edges, you have a triangle. Four edges, which is uh, what you want to strive for, are quads. And then anything above four is an n-gon. And where this comes important is when you get to your texturing phase, and also if you plan on animating, because when you overlay a texture over a quad a quadrangle mesh, it's it's it really helps with the UVs, and I mean, I'm going to get more specific into that kind of stuff in the next tutorial, but it's also important to think of it in animation, like in terms of edge flow. If you look at your arm, you could trace a clear path over your contours, and that's kind of how you want to be building your mesh. You want to look at the contours and the edge flows, and you want to build it that way, because that'll keep you modeling smart and efficiently, and with hopefully as few little polygons as possible you know, to start off with. All right, some of the uh, basic concepts that you want to know in 3D when you're modeling, extrude. This is probably, you know, the biggest one. Extruding is basically pulling a polygon or an edge out of an existing edge. So in this first example, you see I have a cube and I extruded a face out of the cube and it created, you know, another, uh, another four sides and a cap. So um, it's usually similar in most program or in all programs you select a face you usually have some kind of extrude tool or usually they'll have a shortcut such as in cinema 4d if you hold control and drag 
that is kind of the uh, duplicate function. So I think most programs have uh, a shortcut like this. It also works with scale. So if you hold control and scale, you extrude the polygon inner, which creates a new one, and that can be edited individually. Uh, bevels. Bevels are also important. Everything in the world, nothing, nothing has a smooth edge. Even, even like, you know, this PC, this right here, it has a very slight bevel. And, you know, when you're working with realism, it's important to, to think about things like that because it affects shading. You know, if you have um, a perfectly sharp edge versus a beveled edge, um, your light is going to reflect off the edge and give you kind of like a rim highlight, which... Um, you know, that, that's a thing that happens in the real world, so it's important to keep in mind that. So like, you guys have ever seen, like, um, renders of things, and you can clearly tell it's computer-generated. Most of that is because the edges are a bit too sharp. So, like, in the real world, in, like, brand-new things, like, they get worn down, so nothing will have a sharp edge, like, on the, on the left. Mm -hmm. Very important. Uh, the way I model is if I, let's say I wanted, you know, some crazy object, some weird abstract, actually let me do this, some weird abstract thing, I'd usually model it all using, you know, um, regular edges like this and then I'd kind of throw a bevel on top of all of it so that I can, you know, because it's a good thing to do at the end because when you're when you're modeling your your basic shape, you don't want to you know have to add polys here, which then you might have to work with later. Like you know, if I wanted to change this this face right here after I'd already beveled it, now I have you know this going on at the edges because it already has a bevel. So I'd usually you know do all the work before I bevel and then add the bevels. Another really important concept is smoothing, and I think this, Monica, forgive me, it, it's pretty uh, standard across all programs. Smoothing is basically you take an object and you define it as a sort of cage. And then when you put your smooth on it, it will create new objects based on the cage. So this bottom picture really does a good job illustrating it. You have this, this, uh, this square U, and then when you put a, um, a subdivision on it, you can see it uses that cage to kind of map the new points, the new smooth mesh. And this is important because it's also reversible, meaning if you have um, some, you know, model, there needs to be a certain level of detail. And if you model it using low poly and then just view it using um, a generator, like a subdivision surface, your program is now dealing with this many polygons and this generator as opposed to if it was all one mesh. And then now your program now sees this as just a huge mesh with all these polygons. These objects look exactly the same. The one on the left, in program, it has uh, how many polygons? Has 59. This one in program has oh god, 3,700. So it's important to keep that in mind. Here's another concept. This one's a little less important, but it does have its applications. When you think of a form, you know, a rock, if you drill a hole through a rock, you're just going to hit more rock. But if you, you know, drill a hole through an eggshell, you're going to go right through to an inner volume that's not necessarily the eggshell. So you can think of objects as either being defined as a volume or the boundary. So an eggshell is like a boundary. And you can see in this, um, in this picture, this one down here, it doesn't have any, um, any shell thickness. In the program, this is read as a hole in the mesh. Although in this one, with the, with the thickness, this is read as a mesh, uh, like a solid boundary. It's not, it doesn't have a hole in it, which is, depending on your application, it, it, it could be important. 
Also, if you're just going for photorealism, you know, you might want to include that little bit of detail just for the sake of realism. Uh, Alright, this is really important. I'm going to make this big. One of the main kinds of modeling is box modeling, and that is when you start off with a very primitive, sh primitive shape, one of the parametric objects usually, so a box, a cylinder, or, or a sphere, and you add loops as you're modeling only where detail is needed. So if you look at this progression, I started with just a cylinder with seven sides maybe. I kept one side in the middle, down, you know, down his center, and then uh, I think there were just two sides, and then you know, one blocking out his abdominals. And I just added, I think it's seven loops I added here and just fit it to his shape. And I slowly added detail until, you know, as you can see, this, this right here is a pretty, pretty solid mesh. And you can see the subdivided really doing work here. This is the mesh I'm using in viewport, and this is the mesh once I've subdivided it. So um, this, this I thought was a really, um, a really thoughtful example. You see the guy, he's, he's, he actually you know, modeled each finger individually and then because he was so thorough in his process before modeling this, you can see same number of polys on this thumb as there is on the connecting part of his hand. That's very thoughtful modeling. He did a lot of planning for this and you know, the end result, you can see how flawless this topology is. This would be a, a great hand to animate and to rig up. This is normally how I model my characters. I will model that torso like you saw before. I will check my poly count at the, at the shoulder hole. I'll make another cylinder, line it up with the same amount of polys. I will, you know, um, do the same thing I did here. I'll box model the arm out and then I'll connect it. Spline modeling, it's a little different, but it can, it can make a lot of tasks super easy. So for example, this, um, it's when you start with a 2D shape and you use some kind of generator or function to turn it into a 3D mesh, such as an extrude. Um, right here, this right here, you've probably all heard of it. It's a lathe, I think, right? Lathe? Lathe, yeah. What's up? Hmm? No, well, I meant this function right here. All right, so right here, I'm, I drew out this profile of a cup, and then I used a lathe command, which basically takes that profile and sweeps it in a circle. And that generated this mesh right here, which if I were to model this using box modeling, it would be com completely uh, inefficient, and I probably wouldn't come out anywhere near this. And I mean, keep in mind, this you can edit live while the mesh is being generated. So if you, know, you want a little bit more cup here, you can you could do that while having this mesh generate in front of you. Um, over here, I also, this was part of a p grand piano I was modeling. You can see I, I drew out this, this piece right here because it, it was a pretty, peculiar piece to try to box model. I'd have to add a bunch of weird points and then kind of take out a chunk over here. So I decided just to do it with spline modeling and then I added um, some more line cuts in here to clean up my, my topology and my mesh, keep it all quads. I think I have a couple more um, pictures of that later. Sculpting. This one is a very different modeling technique, but based on your background, it might be the most um, comfortable for you. It's probably the most relatable to real life sculpting with clay. You usually start off with a base, um, a sphere with a bunch of polygons and you paint in details using brushes. Whether that brush is pulling the points or pushing the points, twisting, you, you can do a lot. Um, this mesh right here, it was probably made using a specialized texture brush. He probably like made a brush with these kind of these scales, thank you. And he made it into like a grayscale value and then he could paint in that detail just with a single brush click. Now he has, you know, this detail coming from a grayscale picture that you, you've all used uh, Photoshop brushes before, have you? So it's kind of the same premise. You can make brushes and then paint with those brushes, except in this case, you're using the brushes to paint in detail.
So right here, that, that's an example of a base mesh, but when you're actually painting in detail, you're gonna have more like, you know, this amount of polygons. Yeah. I could've, I might've just, you know. Okay. Did I, no, I didn't. So like, uh, let's see. We're gonna need that amount of detail, that amount of subdividing in order to get like really fine detail. Yeah, so right there, that's five million polygons there. Sculpting does, however, you know, you can, it's interactive in the sense that you can decrease poly count on command. But then again, when you're doing that, you're decreasing the amount of detail. So like, there's a pull, you know? You can kind of see how someone would go about making a rock like that. It's just a bunch of, bunch of um, yeah, just a bunch of, bunch of paint strokes, there brush strokes. There are ways around that, um, which I'm sure you'll go over next class, like displacement maps. Oh yeah, displa I was thinking of displacement maps is, yeah, I was thinking of, should I go over it? I can go over it. Um, the, way, the way around that is using a texturing technique called a displacement map, which Alex can talk about. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that at the end. Topology. This is very important, and it's a it's a fancy word for describing how your polygons flow, and you know whether or not you're using all quads or a combination of quads and some nasty n-gons. You can see on this picture right here. Oops. This face is made with a combination of quads, random triangles coming out of nowhere. If you tried to rig this and animate it, it would, it would deform very, very sporadically. You could not, um, you know, predict what was going to happen. Whereas with a mesh where all the polygons are where they need to be and loops around your eyes meet with, you know, loops around your eyes and don't trail off into your nose, that is when you get clean animation and when rigging isn't really a huge process. Here you can... and it's kind of it's very specific certain topologies you really don't have to worry about for example hard surface modeling when you texture a big flat surface like a countertop it doesn't necessarily need to be all clean quads because it's it's just a single flat surface so you can see in this example the one on the left I took the time to go in and fix all the uh, I fixed all the meshing so this was generated right from the extrude this was after I fixed it but you can see here that it renders exactly the same. And with this one, I had no extra work to the, to the model after I made it. The thing with quads is they're really important because it helps with subdividing. Um, quads go four-sided polygons are a lot easier to subdivide than three. You can see how much cleaner this mesh looks yeah. as opposed to this one. Um, it also helps in texture, texture mapping. Um, in this case, if you just had a flat texture map, just one color, it would be fine. But if you actually had something where it Yeah, if you were loading in an image into into this right one, uh, the image would be trying to, it would be good on the edges, on the quads, but then when it gets to the triangles, it would have no idea where certain edges of polygons are supposed to meet with the texture, et cetera, and you'd get, get all kinds of tears and bandings and everything. So, I mean, some of the questions you want to ask yourself when you're, when you're, thinking about topology is am I am I putting this in another program like a game engine if you are you better make sure your topology is super clean and if you're giving this to an animator you need all quads and perfect loops um, you know are you deforming it just with simple bends or such if you wanted to bend something you, you also better hope you know you have quads or else all of a sudden triangle is going to be extruding out of your model into random space texturing like Monica said if you're texturing with an image or just with a shader such as like a color and reflectance and what's easier you know in this case it was much easier to just use the use the generated mesh and and put a texture on it because it gave me the same result so here's another good example you can when you if you look at your hand and bend your thumb it bends at a very specific crease in your hand and you can see that crease in the mesh right here and if you were to select that loop it would select all the way around the thumb exactly where you would expect a thumb to bend if you were to bend it. Uh, ask me something. Anyone have any questions before I go a little bit into displacement mapping? Is there anything you guys really want to know about 3D modeling in particular? Anything you want me to go back to? Just in general, modeling something. Making a fish. Making a fish? Oh, God. I'm going to do some placement mapping first. Ready? Luckily, Cinema has some great uh, templates. Okay, so um, 
Grayscale grayscale images have huge implement uh, implementations in 3D. You can use a grayscale image to define height, to define certain lighting conditions. Um, if anyone's ever heard of bump mapping or normal mapping, you can use pictures to tell the renderer, okay, there's a slight lift here, so make sure there's a highlight on this side, a shadow on this side, and that can save you thousands of polygons worth of detail. So let's let's do a nice example. This isn't my startup. Here we go. So let's look at displacement. Uh, I don't have it in here. Oh, okay, that's okay. Yeah. No, actually, no. I have the perfect thing. Let's take a sphere. Let's add, let's get a better mesh like that one. All quads, let's add a bunch of polys. Let's throw in a magical deformer called a displacer, which this works the same way if you were to use a displacement in your texture, which is probably how most, our, our most other programs do it. But this is the same thing, it's just using grayscale value to drive displacement. So in the shader, this is where we're actually putting our grayscale image that's gonna control our, um, our displacement. So Think of it as if you are defining a displacement of 10 centimeters, wherever your image is black, it is going to displace nothing. Wherever your image is white, it's going to displace full 10 centimeters. And all the gray values in between are just interpolated. So let's. Do you guys know what Let's just throw a classic noise on it, and that's what we get. So you can see, let's let's take open this texture actually. Uh, uh, open window. Ah, so this is what we're working with. This yeah, actually, I have a great picture. Ready? Pretty much, displacement mapping is almost used everywhere nowadays. Take a look at like a skin displacement map. That, that I think that's a displacement map, yeah? Yeah. So what you put this on, on your skin model and you're gonna have all this detail with no extra mesh. So in, in some cases, a displacement map is almost you know required in order you to reach a certain level of realism without you know making 10 million polygons. Um, so yeah, very important to know. So let's let's uh, let's look at some other noises. Zada, uh, that's a cool one. Actually, this is a this is a good one to think about. Box noise. All right, so. And this, this is all interactive, so you know, you want to increase the, the max value, you can do that. You can, you can even animate the max value if you wanted to. Um, all the noises themselves can also be edited. You can scale it down to, oh, that was zero, to this point where at this point you don't have enough, enough mesh to, to try to displace those quads. So if I add more mesh, you'll start to see that now it's bringing up tiny little quads and now we have almost like you know, a displacer city going on. So that's cool, right? You can bring this all the way up. Now we have that. That's cool. All right. Um, I wish I had. I wish I had that can. Yes. The Red Bull. Okay. Like the animation or the the model? I can't make the animation. Displa yeah, displacement maps work the same throughout everything. So just black and white values. Yeah. It's pretty standard in all 3D software. So like Where'd it go? Oh. Displacement map, Maya, P4D, Maya, they're across the board. 
Um, when I modeled this, I think I used the handy, where is it? Right here, I used the, uh, the lathe modeling. So let's see, where's the can? And Red Bull made it easy because when I looked up Red Bull texture, they gave me the greatest texture, a perfectly mapped can. Um, say again? Actually, you know what? Maybe I should do this box modeling because leaving is kind of simple. All right, so I'm, I'm going to do it using kind of box modeling. So start off with a very low poly primitive. So I'm going to drop this down to like eight. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, I don't really want caps on it. So I'm going to take those off. And then right now it's parametric. So if I were to go into point mode and try to grab something, I can't because like I said, the program is reading this as a cylinder, not as any points. So Make it editable. Now I can grab the points. Again, that's not, that's like Monica said, specific to this, but you'll yeah. probably run into something like it. The difference, but like the dynamic between parametric objects and meshes, I'm sure you'll run into it eventually. Let's, let's take a look. Where is it? Where's it can? Whoa. All right. That's what, that's what I'm doing right now. Yeah. So, sorry. No, no, I was about to just, I was about to explain it. I set myself up a plane, the same size as my image, so I can just load that here. Um, what I'm about to, this mechanic is probably different throughout all programs, but usually there is a way you can uh, kind of lock in a certain display mode. So I want this reference image to always show in full shading with no, with no wireframe. So I just set it to that. And now when I, if I move into one of these viewports, I can see my cam behind there. So that's important. Let me turn off the specular. There we go. Okay, so first thing I do is I line up my model to, to the rough size right there. So we got that and we got... All right. All right, so then I would uh, start looking at the detail. So right here we have a little rim. So uh, I know I need... I need I need more detail because right now I have no um, polygons on this edge, so I'm going to add an edge loop right here, which basically just cuts a slice through a model, and if it follows a loop. So if you have a like if you were to take an edge loop of an arm, it would most likely follow. Depending on your mesh, it would follow the arm maybe you know across your back. It depends on the loop. In this case, it's just a cylinder, so it goes all the way around. So I'm going to add two polygons here just so. I can get that bevel so I can get a hard edge. I'm going to extrude that out. And then at the bottom it has kind of the same thing, except it goes in a little bit. So I'm going to add another edge loop right there and another one here. I'm going to grab these, scale them in. And then I believe the bottom of the can kind of wraps up a little bit. So let's add that a little bit. I'm going to scale in another edge right here and drop it down. I'm going to scale in another edge and bring it up. And then I'm just going to finish off with a cap. Okay, back at the top. Um, let's see. From what I can remember, it kind of does the same thing. It goes back in, maybe, oops, a little higher, and then back in again. Sorry about, I don't know what, why that's happening. <laughs> Alright, and then it finishes off with another edge. Alright, so right here, you can notice I have zero polygons in the center, and that's just because I don't need them. There's no detail, it's just texture. If I were to throw this into a hypernerves, uh, you can kind of see how it smooths it out. I can I see I need more detail down here, so let's add oops. Say again? Did I say hypernerves? I meant subdivision surface. It used to be called hypernerves. 
but basically just the defining your mesh as a cage and making a new smooth mesh under that, that's what I meant, the subdivision surface. So let's add some more detail down here because right there that's way too smooth. Let's take a look at our picture. How's it look? Okay, so let's add another edge loop right here. And let's pull it in even more, right? Like right there. We can move this up a little bit. This condition right here, which is technically a bevel, that's what's going to give you your tight edges. So actually, let me add another one. Add another one right here. Oops. So generally the way smoothing works in um, 3D modeling software is it'll take two lines and then calculate a curve between them. So the closer your lines are, the sharper that curve will be. So that's why you can add more to an edge sharp edge. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the farther apart they are, the like if you follow these edges while I add more subdivision loops, you can see um, this edge is interpolated right here. This one is interpolated. This one's interpolated. I can add another subdivision, and we have twice as many interpolated ones, and another one. And obviously, you stop after your mesh is you know smooth smooth to the eye because you don't need all these extra polys. All right, so let's let's look at the top. Actually, you know what? This probably needs to be brought down a little bit more. I'm going to add another nut edge loop right here and pull it in so I can get kind of a curve. Yeah, there we go, that kind of rim. Um, that little metal piece, that is that is a pain. Let's see, what's it called? A uh, can top? Can topper? Yes. Now that's a, that's a, an ugly shape to try to try to do, but let's, let's try it. Um, Let's do a nice box model for this. So the general shape is obviously, you know, a little, a little rectangle sort of thing. So let's get our cube roughly. Do you have any symmetry? Symmetry. I usually use symmetry for for person like human models, just because trying to create good topology. You know, if you can do it on one side, then you're blessed. Because trying to mirror the same kind of curves over two arms without without Symmetry, you're never going to do it. So most 3D softwares have a symmetry function where if you're modeling something symmetrical, you can usually get away with only modeling half of it and then either mirroring it or having symmetry on so that it's replicated without having to like, you know, do all that work and kind of make sure everything's perfect and like, you know, the scale and everything. Her example is a car chassis. You, you can model the body, you can model lights and, and the grill, all symmetry, and you know it's half the work done for you because the other half is being made perfectly. All right, so let's take a look back at this a little bigger. All right, so we have a hole right here and then uh, another hole here, kind of a hole there. So let's, let's do that, let's add I th I'm going to start off with two segments, and then I'm going to make it editable. Actually, you know what? I might have lied. I might want to start with a plane instead. Sorry. <laughs> Alright, so again, two polygons. Alright, let's do this. Alright, so... First thing I think I'm going to do is I'm going to extrude this polygon in, oops, and I'm going to delete it. So now I have that hole. If I throw this into a subdivision surface, you can already see it coming together. Um, let's look at this condition. It has a loop. All right, so let's let's think about that. Uh, let's do another extrude just to give us some more polygons to work with. And let's see. Let's do another one. And then let's see what happens if we take out this loop right here. Did I do it? Oh, yeah, I did. And let's throw it into a polygon. Okay, we're getting some, some crazy stuff happening. So let's look what's happening. Um, it looks like... 
Did I forget something? I can't see what's going on. Oops. Actually, before I do anything, let's throw it into a cloth. This is this part is going to be different throughout your programs, but typically there is a modifier that can add depth to a flat surface. So in this case, I want to, you know, this thing has obviously got a little bit of depth to it. So right there, you can see that that pretty much just added another face to it and then connected those faces at the edges. And that's just extruded up Yeah, it's basically the same thing as an extrude, but you know, you can you can have a like a crazy twisting and bending mesh and then um, you know add a thickness to it you often do it with cloths you know so like you simulate a cloth using a flat surface and then you add that thickness with a modifier typically let's keep going all right so let's see how I throw it back in all right so now we're getting something we're getting close uh, I'm gonna add another another subdivision just so I can get smoother. All right, let's see, let's see, getting good. Probably needs to be actually. Here's a here's a great bevel point. Um, obviously, this this metal piece isn't smooth at the edges. It has these tiny bevels. You can see the uh, the the highlight along the edge. So let's add that. I'm gonna select these edges. Oops, didn't select that one. Right there. And let's add the tiniest bevel right here. Let's make it three, just because I want a really hard edge. And now if we subdivide it, now we have this very sharp edge. And I could I could have even beveled inside here to get that sharp edge too. I probably should have. But let's let's take a look what we got. Um, So we, we have a pretty a solid shape working with, and now from here, it's just about moving the edges you have um, where they need to be. So obviously this, this uh, hole is more, um, it's more of a, an ellipse than a circle. So let's, uh, let's add another, let's add an edge loop down the middle so I can add some, whoops, edge loop, loop, loop. Where's my loops? All right, I'm going to do a plain loop. There we go. Alright, so I just added some, some more detail there. Now I can grab these points. And I can move the oops. I can move these out. And I can move this one down and it's a little bit rounder at the top. So I can take this one. Actually no, I was working. All right. <laughs> so around, bringing that up will give me more of that oblong shake. I can grab all of these points and bring them down, and then there. Now you can really see the kind of the kind of shape that makes there. So that's really close to what we have there. Probably a little bigger. But I mean, when you're at this stage, again, it's just it's just artistic tweaking, moving points here and there to kind of block out the shape. Let's, let's let's do a quick render. Let's see what we got. Let's turn on this subdivision. And let's let's throw that material on there. Whoa. So here, here's a perfect example of when your topology does not agree with your texture. But I didn't want to put the texture there anyway. I want the texture just to be on the sides. So I can fix that. Yeah, I'm going to do a whole texturing tutorial. Just this is just for the sake of, you know, finishing off with a pretty picture. Wait, that's the wrong one. Sorry. I didn't download the texture. Texture. Let's put a nice metal texture on the entirety of the can. And then let's put 
our Red Bull can texture just on this side edge. Let's turn on our, our oopsie. Aha, this is where these, where I, uh, you have to think about edges again. So right now my subdivide is, is interpolating between this top edge and all the way to the bottom edge because there's nothing in between. So it's squeezing my texture. So to fix that, I'm just going to move that down and add, I'll add two loops here, two loops there. And, oh, well, yeah, you're right, I have to reselect. Did I do it on the bottom? I don't know, let's see. Boom. Boom? Nope, I didn't do it on the bottom. Jesus Christ. just a um I was gonna do materials in the next thing but do you want me to do a little bit of material up to me was that it was that a yeah that was a yeah okay all right uh okay let's make something new then What's up? The, the little lid that you had on the, the can. Yep. If you were to animate the Red Bull can like you did, would you have to connect that to the main object somehow? No. See, uh, if I were to just throw both these objects into another group called Red Bull can, they're all in this hierarchy, so they're all moved together. Oh. You know, I could even put a rigid body on it and drop it like I did. So, a little bit of texturing. Let's let's take a look. Uh, there are two ways you could slap some color on your objects, and one is one is usually referred to as a texture, and one is a material. Materials are more physically based, meaning uh, you define whether or not your texture is bumpy, whether or not it's smooth, whether it has blurry reflections or perfect reflections. So let, let's let's see. Here, here are the channels. It's slightly different throughout programs, but it, generally you're dealing with uh, reflectance, you're dealing with color, diffusion, uh, some kind of luminance or emission. Um, the bumps and normals I was talking about earlier, here's your displacement map for, for your textures. Um, all right, so let's, let's, let's add a light in here too. Actually, you know what I want to do? I want to add a sky. Right now, zero, zero materials on this. This is what we get. Just the base clay shader and all your programs. Let's throw this one on. All this has is a, is a color channel with 80% white in it. Let's, let's check out the reflection channel because this is where stuff gets cool. By default, you have a specular. A specular is basically just a light reflection. So um, like when you look at any surface and you see like the reflection of a light above you, that's a specular. You know what I mean? So um, let's take that off and let's put on just a pure reflection on it. All right, so right now this material is 100% reflective. So it's basically casting rays out from the mesh to, to the scene around it and just um, reflecting whatever it sees. You're, you're not getting a very good representation just because there's not much in the scene and this is a very basic mesh. So let's, let's get something else. Let's bring in a model actually, like a fork. Jeez. And let's give us something to reflect, like an HDRI. All right. So let's run to this fork. Aha. Uh -huh. So all this light here you're seeing, the blue in this in this uh, monitor, the the lights above the scene, this is all being reflected because this fork has a 
reflective material on it. And this, this works physically accurate. So um, assuming your, your, you know, your curves line up, the, the reflections are going to line up based on the, the curves of the fork. So let's, let's, uh, let's make it a blurry fork. So uh, this was 100% um, non-rough reflection. So that's like a perfect sheet of uh, metal, almost like a mirror, actually. As you up this roughness value, it is simulating kind of micro bumps on your surface. So um, instead of light being reflected with a single ray of, of reflection, I don't know if you all took physics, but um, if you add roughness, then all of a sudden when light hits your object, it's dispersing in all directions. So you're not going to get a perfect, a perfect light reflection. You're not going to get a, um, you know, this effect. The light's going to be dispersed and the highlight is going to be traveling along your object now. Um, and that, that kind of just depends on the material you're working with. You know, if you want to, we can look at some metal objects. Metal. Whoa. So let's look at this one. This kind of metal, this is called, these hyper, hyper scratches or hyper threading mini scratches, it's called uh, anescoptry, which basically, that's what it's called, right? An anescop, anescop, uh, let's see, anescoptry. No words. Okay. I'll find it. Right here. Uh, anisotropic. And that does basically what I said. It adds little micro scratches to your metal. So that would, um, when you're, when you render, oh, well, this doesn't have any scratches. It just has a, uh, let's add some scratches, scratches, primary. And then if you look at this, oh, not yet, not yet. That, there we go. Now I got to add some of that. Whole There is there's a lot, yeah. There there's a lot of uh, concepts just that are present just in light. That if you understand, it would make making materials and stuff so much easier. Just because you you know what's supposed to happen, you can see what you're getting, and then you can kind of come up with a solution based on the differences between you know. Um, let's look at some more metals. Uh, metal, metal, metal. Aha! Look at this. All right, I'll do a little bit of bump, a little bit of, so this right here, this could be rendered with 100 million polygons with detail um, showing for every little little bump you have here. Or you can put a texture in with white and black values showing these little cuts in the metal and then you can load that into the reflectance channel or the bump channel or the displacement channel and that'll do all that detail for you. So that's, I think Cinema 4D comes with that classic uh, surface, let's see, bump, let's look at the bumps, what we got, what we got. So the main difference between bump maps and displacement maps is bump map kind of, it, it's what it sounds like, they bump out your texture, so it's more of a softer, more subtle um, texture, whereas displacement maps will literally displace, displace your polygons. Bump, bump is all visual. It, the render handles it all. So, for example, if I were to make a material or a reflective material, put it on this. Right now, 100% reflective, no roughness. It reflects the surface perfectly. If I put a bump on it and simulate some some curves in the surface, now you can see I got this, which, with absolutely no extra detail, I now have all these new reflections being calculated. And uh, like in the displacement, this this is all editable. So now we have this, which is almost like a thin piece of metal that someone is, you know, like kind of jiggling in their hand, you know, adding some 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 warps. Uh, yeah. oh, what's this one do? Let's see. Look at that. Now we ha where you see these black values, it is you you can you know tell visually where it's adding zero reflection or zero you know, zero perfect reflection, and then everywhere else, 
it's being mapped right now it's all kind of gray so like it's not even it's not a full reflection that's like a you know a half reflection but it's all it's all being calculated based on this grayscale value um i was looking for that yeah that's what i was looking for whoa whoa what's happening oh man oh okay it's in the grid actually here we go that's not it jesus you also going to run into this a lot when your 3d program just decides to do some crazy things at you oh, i don't need to say this No, I didn't stress it enough, but it's very it's very important that you understand this this concept of using grayscale values to kind of control data. So like this texture, it can go on the bump and you can simulate the, the micro bumps on the surface. So like, well, I put that there and now I have that happening. Or, you know, if you want, you can decide to control the literal reflection, uh, reflectance. So now you have a reflective surface with a bunch of non-reflective dots on it. I mean, and depending on what you're trying to make you know these dots can be pain or, or this or that and you could use this grayscale value to to then map on extra detail on top using this as a mask like in Photoshop so I could have a bunch of different noises only being affected where where I have this thing so watch this I wanna let's say I wanna let's do it in the bump actually it's funner let's add a layer let's add a noise let's I think the the programs that have node editor node yeah. editor systems you can do this kind of stuff. It's obviously a different it's different visually because you're now connecting nodes in in a you know in a in a spreadsheet as opposed to working in layers with hierarchy. But I mean it's the same concept. You're using certain values to map other certain values. So right now I have a noise only on the texture that I was using for those bumps, and I used a burn. But you know what I think. Layer, layer mask is better. Yeah, layer mask. So now it's doing the opposite. It's putting noise wherever it's um, wherever that previous texture was white. So now it's these perfectly lifted bumps with a noisy lower lower level. So I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. It's almost hard to you know try to think of examples. Let's throw this into the bump or the displacement. Let's see what happens. You can see right there what's kind of happening. If I were to render this with the displacement channel, it's literally moving moving my polygons down. So if you're going for realism, displacement as opposed to bump and normal, displacement is going to give you the best because it's actually moving polygons. And, and it, yeah, of course. Normals can also do um, crazy things for you. If you look up normal mapping versus bump map, uh, you can see this is how a normal map works. It, it works in color, so basically it's saying, like, for example, where green is, that is pointing out in this direction of space, where blue is, is that way, purple that way, and that way it kind of, it helps your lighting, because, you know, your, the renderer knows where there are, where there's an, um, like, a, sh a shallow part and a raised part, because that's all being calculated with um, the normal. Now that you say that, though, there are uh, there are RGB displacement modes that you can do. So, like, you can see this. This was using an RGB mode, and now it's not only going up and down, but it's also displacing on on a rail kind of. Sorry. <laughs> so, one of the best things you can do in any program is go to the documentation and just read it. Cinema 4D specifically has a incredible documentation. I read it just for fun, honestly. But you can just see how much how much stuff you can do. Um, all, all 3D software will have documentation. Yeah, usually it's online. Yeah. Yeah, so just right click till you see something that says help or mm -hmm. right here it shows help. Um, 
What was I gonna do after this? I don't remember. Alex. Yep. Being, yeah, they're right now the black dots are in the displacement channel. So um, if I were to read this logically, how it's how the program is reading it, I am displacing with a height of five centimeters, and wherever it's white, I am not our full displacing. Wherever it's black, I'm not displacing at all. So in terms of this mesh, you know, the, I mean, you can see it visually. But what's interesting about displacement and what really saves out on polygons and data is this this thing right here called sub polygon displacement which basically looks at your mesh, says, okay, I have a four by four polygon mesh, let's subdivide it just for the sake of displacement into a 64 by 64 by 64 mesh. And now I have all this, uh, this virtual data to work with to try to get the clean edges I'm looking for. If I were to raise this up to eight, my render time would be doubled, but now this, uh, these, these curves you can see are so much more um, you know, detailed and, and smooth and there's no, there's no texture messing happening. And obviously taking much longer to render. Because to the renderer, it's, it's you know, now 6,000 polygons as opposed to... Yeah, if you ever thought to yourself in school why math is important, you get a lot of, lot of examples of it in here. Just like the things you can calculate, it's really cool. You guys are going to have fun. We just play with it. Yeah. Um, I can show some differences between normal and bump a little bit. Let's hope I have one. Normal. Cork. Do you guys have any questions? I'll do anything. Shout yeah, it out. Lighting. lighting? You want me to do lighting too? Damn, Mark. All right, let's do some lighting then. <laughs> what? I'm, what? Well, I mean, uh, no. That I'm doing. I'm doing a specific lighting one in a couple weeks, which is going to be super, super detailed. You know, like how light works, how materials work. But I can go over a little lighting, I guess. Uh, we can talk about you know making like a solid scene, like a solid front to back scene. Let's do that. All right. So let's say we wanted to pose beautifully this cube. So let's say I wanted a nice, realistically modeled cube. I start with the primitive. I make it editable. Actually, in this case, I'd probably just keep it parametric. But I'd add that lovely bevel that I was talking about. That's so ever important to realism. And then I get myself, let's give myself, does anyone do photography? No one? Damn. Jerry, Jerry's not here. All right, well, when you're working in 3D, it almost helps to learn to, to know how, how you would light a photograph. You know, if you were posing this box in a scene and, and taking pictures of it, you'd probably have, you know, a key light lighting it specifically, or the main light, which lights it, then you'd have like, a fill light over here to brighten up the shadows that you have and then you probably have a backlight in the back and then these lights obviously need to have different parameters so I'd want my the fill light to probably be the strongest maybe give it a little bit of blue tint um, I would probably want my key light to be much weaker only slightly illuminating the shadows maybe like add a cool color to balance it out and the back, the back light, I'm just gonna make it super low, just just so I don't have any like harsh blacks in my scene. Um, I also don't have any shadows on, so let's turn on shadows for my main light, and let's see what comes out of the render. Even so, 
you all should be just taking pictures with your phone anyway of beautiful things and practicing composition and all this stuff I think it's really helpful to have a, a creative Instagram for, for your creative outlets you know it's helpful what are you laughing at president I didn't even plug myself I'm telling these young souls to get an Instagram so they can have a creative outlet and take pretty pictures all right, so th this is pretty nice lighting right here. Uh, we have this nice clean shadow, but I would never, I would never have just a simple floor. I usually, because um, I do have a little bit of photography background, I like to make a curved backdrop so that my shadows have a have somewhere to fall off. So uh, I make a oh too many polygons, so I probably keep it like two three by three. I make this. I take the back wall, raise it up. Then take this and like back and raise a little bit, and then I add that handy subdivision surface, and now I have this lovely little backdrop that my cube can live in. So now if I were to take a picture, I now have a clean falling off background as opposed to like a you know a black horizon with a black sky back there. Uh, there are no materials on this, so let's add some materials. And also, actually, for anything, let's talk about this lovely thing called ambient occlusion. Um, ambient occlusion is a very, very important thing. It'll make a render look from from like a, it'll turn a render from like a two D, a two D looking thing to like, oh wow, this is three D and has depth. So, ambient occlusion. Let's just look what comes up. To try and understand it. Uh, all right, so. This is, this is a cool pass. Oh, what the heck? Okay, never mind. Sorry, it's moving around too much. All right, here's a good one. So all the shadow you see here and in his eyes and, and where his collar meets his neck, that shadow is all done through ambient occlusion, which basically is, um, is calculating, you know, where is the ambient light hitting less? And that, the answer to that is obviously, you know, in cracks. If you look at like an overcast day, where the, where the sky is basically like one big soft box. There are, there are no shadows on the ground, but you know, underneath cars and underneath, uh, I can't find a good pick. Overcast shadows. Uh, da, 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 da. No pictures, come on. Wow, okay, can't find anything. All right, but if you look at the difference between what I had before without ambient occlusion and what I have after, very small change, but very important change, and that's it's this shadow right along the edge here where the corner is meeting the the bottom of the backdrop. That is something that is it's you know it's photo that the ambient occlusion the idea of it is it's a real it's a physical thing you know if you have if you look at a car underneath it you have this big shadow because light just doesn't get underneath that car as much as it does everywhere else because you know you have all these collisions happening the light is getting weaker as it as it hits surfaces and disperses so that's just an important thing you always want to have ambient occlusion on uh, let's add some let's add some materials to it let's uh, let's just put that there let's see what it gives us cool uh, let's say I want like a really tight specular on it. Let's see. That tight specular, that thing I just lowered, you can see it right here. That light, it's it's still pretty like a pretty diffused source, but if I were to keep um, like tightening this specular, you'd see it slowly getting more and more crisp. Whereas if I were to raise this all the way up, you get almost a f like a that's like basic diffused object, full micro bumps on the surface complete scattering of light when it hits and um, I mean it's good to understand these just so when you're when you're making your scene you you know what's supposed to happen like if you have a metal if you have a like a plastic a plastic surface you know you want the light to be really diffused because plastic isn't a perfect reflection or I mean the plastic I'm talking about is more of like this kind of plastic not like the transparent plastic Ah, like this. That's a good example. These micro bumps are diffusing the light. Actually, this this right here. Let's let's look at that. Let's do that. Let's say we wanted to add like a very 
slight bump on on the on the backdrop, like because you know no surface is really that perfect. Have tiny little bumps and lower it very slightly. Ooh, too much, too much. Uh, Fifteen. Still too much. Two. So that right there, I don't know if you can even tell on the monitor, but it, it's almost making the, the backdrop look almost like a canvas, which, you know, depending on your renderer, I mean, depending on what you're trying to make, it could be better. But in this scene, I think it's just better because, you know, it adds some, some inconsistencies in the backdrop. It, it's a little bit more visually stimulating seeing all these little micro bumps and everything. Uh, we can add a something to the sphere, just or the, the cube. Let's just add, let's look at some presets. What we got? Glossy dark blue. Looks, oh, no, I don't want that. Never mind. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's add a plastic, actually. Plastic, plastic. Plastic. Plastic black glossy. Plastic black high roughness. Plastic black glossy. Well, let's add another one with the plastic the plastic glass high roughness too, just to see the difference. Mm, mm -hmm. All right, so uh, reading from this, just comparing the plastics, the one on the left that's more glossy, you can see that you can see this detail being reflected. It's actually, can you see? Can you guys see on the monitor how there's like a very slight form here. I don't know if you can see. It is? Okay, let me try. From this way. Alright, right there. You see how uh, there's an obvious line right here, whereas it's gone here? That's because there is something in the background ref being reflected that's adding this, you know, this little, in this little uh, difference here. There's probably, let's, let's look what's behind this. Because I have an H to ride, but actually I don't have an H to ride back there. Let me add one so we can actually see some reflectance. Alright, so that's a better example. The TV screen that you saw before in the picture I was using, this is it being reflected and, and diffused on this surface because it, it's got a slight roughness but not too much, whereas on this one, you know, the blue is almost all gone. It's being um, diffused across the entire surface there. Um, and that if I were to make another one and add absolutely zero roughness on it, like I said before. Oh, you can almost see the reflection in the viewport. That's nice. That's handy. See? Now we can see the, the thing behind us which is, yep, that TV. You can see on this side it's not reflecting anything because what's facing down here is just the backdrop. Hmm. All right, I mean, anything else? Any, any questions? Anything specific? What do you guys want? Want to add a cup? You can make a cup. A quick cup. Let's add like a nice glass right here. Profile. very big on the animation, or not animation, but motion graphics, like being able to control a bunch of different objects 
um, with using effectors. You all took CS 104, right? Or 103? Print hello if in I equals 15, raise, you know, all that stuff. That actually has huge uh, implications in this program if, if you can kind of make the connection. Let me just add a cup for fun. Hey, we got a cup, guys. Let me show you a little bit of that as, as the last thing. So let's pretend that um, this is CS104 and this isn't 3D and we're just, we just have all this data, you know, and we can access it through our 4x in this list, you know, we all are familiar with those commands, 4x and blah, 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 blah. So let's, let's pretend that we can, instead of typing out that kind of um, for x and this that kind of function we can use this magical thing called what for loops for loops yeah 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 that's what i'm talking about let's pretend that we can execute a for loop visually using this magical effector with this lovely thing called a fall off so all right so oops all right you can already see what's happening but right now i have this set of of clones all with their own data points and etc and I'm using this effector, which is saying, you know, if we're, based on this range of influence, this in the red means 100%, in the yellow it's mapped to zero. In this range of influence, if there's a clone in, raise it by the max value, you know, interpolated based on um, whatever the fall off is. So right here, you can see this happening, right? That's cool, and that can be done, you know, on absolute insane scales. So like if you want. You Oops. I crashed in a And when you're doing motion graphics, this is where being parametric in your workflow really helps. Like as you saw right there, I have a hundred hundred thousand cubes and I made them all shrink, you know, instantly. Now they're all little dots. I could add a segment if I wanted to all of them. But uh so let's do something cool. Let's say, let's say we want to just animate this rolling through for whatever reason. Okay, so right there I just I set two keyframes for the position of this effector, one at zero, one at forty-five, and if I play it through, it does this. Right, pretty cool. But since um, you know all this are just little data points being affected, just like in CS 103, let's let's add some more effectors on. Let's call it something called a delay, which a delay basically does. If you guys are probably off, it's it's kind of hard to explain, but you know how in certain animations things have secondary motion, like jiggles. If something's moving really fast, it'll slow down and kind of set into place. We can do that. We can um, simulate that if we throw a delay effector on this group and say, whenever one of these clones is affected, I want to apply a springy kind of delay to it. Now we have this. Whoa! So now, as it moves down, it's it has to uh, it moves a little bit too far down because of the velocity and you know the, this, how far it's moving up and all this crap. It's all math that you can think about, or you can just kind of you know understand how the basics work. It's pretty cool. If I if I edit this here right here, I'll get different amounts of spring. Yeah, that's cool. Almost like a wave. Yeah. Um. I mean that right there. That's like the basics of motion graphics right there. Stuff like this for the second year will be very helpful next semester with the abstract project. Pretty much, you'll have to make like. Oh, actually, that reminds me. I could go over a little bit about deformers. Like, eh, eh, not really. I was going to do a little bit more displacement mapping. What do you guys want to see? I mean, are you all tapped out for the day?
if you know Photoshop too, you know, there are a lot of parallels. show where is it where is it do you guys see a posterize somewhere in here posterize huh where projector what posterize oh it is right here god damn it You guys all know the posterize effect in Photoshop, the thing that kind of turns things into very basic blocks of color, sort of? Let me get an example. Yeah, so this, yeah. Just, just as a, like a, you know, example, um, let's say I wanted to take, there, there's a really cool displacement model of a, of a Mayan temple using just a full-on 2D texture to create this whole procedural, uh, like editable temple and it, it started off like this it started off with a with a gradient which then was posterized to get these levels and then noise was overlaid on the levels to get a bunch of different cracks and and stuff into the um into the mesh and it, it was a really really nice example i wish i had it but i'm not sure where it is ah, okay it started like that and when I mean procedural, I mean like, you know, you go in here, add more levels, all of a sudden your temple has twice as many levels. Um, if I go back into here and add a, whoa, add a noise and make it a, make it a, whoa. Now you can kind of see how, how, how like the, just how many, Capabilities displacement mapping alone has. Alright. Um, I mean, yes. Anything else, guys? I'm up for questions or concerns, challenges. What am I going to talk about next week? Good question, Geo. Next week, I'm going to hopefully do a more in-depth thing on texturing and materials. As, uh, let's see, is that true? Let's see, what did I put here? Texturing, yeah, that makes sense. How do you guys feel? Do you feel smarter? Yeah. Yeah? No.